that song reminds us that uh, the way life works is not outside in, but inside out. That uh, there is something that can be within us that is greater than the things around us that press upon us. And one of the big reasons we come together on these times on Sunday morning is so we can renew that connection and renew that sense of inside presence and power that we can draw on. And so let's come before God and invite Him to renew that in us right now. Father, as we come before You this day to this place, we are grateful for who You are. We are grateful for the fact that You're a lofty and majestic God, but yet You're a God that is so close and so near as to not just be accessible to us, but as to be within us. We thank You this day. We thank you for the fact that we can know you personally. Yeah, we can understand all the philosophical arguments that has to deal with your existence, but we can know because you reside in us and make a difference in us. And we praise you this day for who you are and for all that you have done and for all that you provide and that for all that you bring to our lives. We're grateful. We're grateful. We're grateful, Father, for the fact that we can come to you with our requests and our concerns, that we can sit there and be open with you about the things that are going on in our lives and know that you don't judge us and that you don't look down upon us, but that you come around us and and draw your resources to bear upon us to where we can stand up under the pressure or we can go forward in the midst of the pain or we can do whatever we need to do. Father, you know what's represented in this room this morning. You know the hurts. You know the frustrations. You know the confusion. You know the wisdom that's needed. You know the guidance that is sought. You know all that makes up who we are this day. And Father, as we just sung, as you can minister to us from the inside out, may you, from that platform inside of us, may you work in our lives in all these circumstances and situations. May you draw near to us and may you supply us a strength that we need, an insight that we lack, an awareness that will enable us to go forward with you. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the fact that nothing that is going on in our lives is lost on you. And I just ask that this day, as we continue to worship you, that you would continue to renew that connection. May it be tight. May it be intimate. May it be sure. And may it be sufficient for each and everything that we encounter. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. And as we continue to worship, we ask your continued blessing upon each of us. And the people agreed by asking this in Jesus' name and saying... Amen. Let's continue to worship Melinda. Church family, you can have a seat. Thanks so much. As we continue our worship this morning, ushers, if you would step forward to receive our tithes and offerings. If you're a guest with us, we do not want you in any way to feel pressured. Uh, we just would love to, you to enjoy, enjoy the sense of God's presence that we're confident and sure is here this morning. We'd love it if all of you would put in connection cards. Let us know you're here any way that we can uh, come alongside you in prayer, rejoice with you at what God's been doing in your life. We count that a real privilege. And so I'd ask you to put those in the offering plate as it comes by as well. Father, thank you this day for who you are and for, again, the opportunity to cultivate your presence, to draw strength and supply from you. And also, Father, for this opportunity as well to partner with you We recognize that through the giving of our resources to you, we are stakeholders in what you're doing in this community and around the world. We thank you for the fact that you choose to partner with us, and may your blessing rest upon both us and that which we give so that you can become more known and your kingdom can expand in this place and around the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Melinda. Thanks, guys, for that fall backdrop with the leaves falling, reminding me I need to rake my yard. So, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 was, I was doing a good job till about two weeks ago, and then it took over and uh, need, to, need to get after it again. So uh, it's, it's that time of year. But uh, um, 
gonna gonna continue to build upon what we started last week. If you were here, we began a series called Soul Matters that looks at our soul, and uh, want to begin this morning by uh, there's a there's a little book at the back of the New Testament called Third John. Um, it's one of those uh, snack size books, if you will, of the Bible. It's only one chapter, and it's a personal correspondence between the Apostle John and a man whose name is Gaius. We don't know anything about Gaius. Um, but I want you to listen to how John greets him. In fact, it's probably on the front of your worship folder or on the screen. I'm going to read it as well. Wonderful greetings. You can tell that there's a fondness between the two of them. He says, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you even as your soul is getting along well. And the question I've been thinking about as I've been kind of reflecting upon that is uh, what is John wanting for Gaius when he expresses this, this hope for him? What does it mean for a soul to get along well? And how can we know, relevant to our own soul, how can we know whether that is or is not happening? I think many of us, if you were to ask us what comes to mind with the idea of your soul getting along well, many of us would sit there and probably equate how well our soul is getting along with how things may be going for us in our private worship or our personal devotional life with God. If we're consistent in our devotional life, if we've kind of caught a rhythm when it comes to the practice of some private disciplines that connect us to God, then we'd say, you know, our soul's getting along okay or well. But as I was thinking about that, I thought of the Pharisees of Jesus' day. And they were the group of people for whom he reserved his harshest words of criticism, but yet they were very conscientious about their personal religious habits. They were very um, painstakingly uh, conscientious, very religious, very exacting in their individual piety. But their souls, their souls were really, really messed up. I mean, these were the ones that, uh, you know, they were, they were so misguided that, you know, when, when the promised one of God showed up, and they've been waiting for him for years, centuries, when, when Jesus showed up to fulfill the promises of the prophets, not only did they not recognize him, but they were the people who were at the forefront of the movement to get rid of him. And so I think, you know, the way the Pharisees led their life, it leads me to believe that there's got to be a whole lot more to our soul getting along well than just how we're doing on the personal religious habits front. There's got to be more to it than that. There's others of us, if you were to ask us what it means for our soul to get along well, we would probably default to... You know, how, how we're feeling about our relationship with God, about our faith at that time. Do we feel up? Do we feel like we're at a good place in our connection with God? And the problem with this is that those kinds of feelings are, are largely, not exclusively, but largely emotional. And, 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 and if, If the well-being of our soul is tied to how we're doing emotionally in terms of our feelings of connection or contact with God at any moment, then the sense of our soul getting along well, that's going to be a very inconsistent thing. It's going to be kind of spasmodic and, and, and hit and miss. It's going to be up and down. There's not going to be a sense of permanence and stability there. But yet I'm convinced that perhaps the most essential thing to our personal happiness and well-being is whether or not our soul is getting along well. 
A soul that is getting along well, it fosters a sense of blessing that blankets the rest of our life. And a soul that is not getting along well fosters a sense of blight and torment that casts a shadow over the rest of our lives. And so this morning, like I said, I want to continue an emphasis. We began last week a series of messages called Soul Matters. We're looking at this soul, that this capacity, this deepest, most important part of who we are, this, this God-given faculty that, that distinguishes us and separates us from the rest of all creation. We have a soul, and it's been given to us by God, and we don't understand it all the time. In fact, the soul is so deep, there's, there, there's parts of us we can't seem to get our minds around, we can't seem to grasp, we certainly can't control. I mean, that's part of the reason the writers of the Bible, a lot of times, particularly in the Old Testament, in the Psalms particularly, the writers, when they address the soul, they almost speak of it in third person. Like, the, like the, what the psalmist says in Psalm 103, the first verse, Praise the Lord, O my soul. On my inmost being, praise His holy name. It's like this soul is... is is, is, is a separate entity from itself. Or, or Psalm 42, the first five, he goes, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? They, they speak of it in third person. And I think sometimes the reason they do is because they recognize there's this depth to our soul. That, that, that's beyond our ability to comprehend. It's beyond our ability to fully grasp. If you were here last week, we, 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 we launched and started off this, this series by talking about how the ancient people, when they used the word soul, how they understood it or how they took it to, to mean. They, 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 to them, the soul was, was, was this internal capacity that, that, that pulls together our, our mind and our will and our, our body into an integrated being. The soul is, is what unites our thoughts and our feelings and our habits and our appetites and our ability to choose, which, which pulls all these things together around a common vision for our life. And we also talked about how the soul is a fragile thing, how it can be misdirected, how it can get hurt, how it can go awry. How if our soul is not satisfied, it can wreak havoc and introduce discord and brokenness into our lives. So the question, how's your soul doing? That's a vitally important question for us to think about and reflect on. The issue of our soul getting along well, that's a relevant issue we need to give some attention to. So this morning, I want us to give some thought to that. I want us to look at some questions like, how can you and I know and pursue soul satisfaction? How can we realize a contented, satisfied soul? And I want to share with you three observations from the Word of God that I think speak directly to that issue. They're pretty simple, but I think they're pretty profound as well. Observation number one, our soul must be gratified. But it's never gratified by the attempt to seek gratification. You understand that? Our soul has got to be gratified. But if we're sitting there trying to seek gratification, it will come at the expense of our soul. I mean, that's one of the paradoxical paradoxical things about it. The soul needs to be satisfied, but when we give ourselves over to the pursuit of satisfaction, our soul becomes imperiled. When our life becomes consumed with the quest for satisfaction or delight or for pleasing ourselves, the health and the well-being of our soul, it's placed in jeopardy. And the reason why is because the soul was meant for God. It's His domain. It's His realm. And it's only when we give ourselves to honoring God and place honoring God above pleasing ourselves that we will find true satisfaction. Jesus said as much in Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 36. He said, What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Or he continues, What can a man give in exchange 
for his soul. The words of Jesus, you know, he, he basically said here, is that when you and I place pleasing ourselves at the top of the list, that we actually place our soul at risk. But when we place honoring God above pleasing ourselves, that's when our soul can find satisfaction. The life that enriches, the life that nourishes our soul, it must be about more than realizing our personal desires because, folks, we will never achieve satisfaction. We'll never achieve satisfaction if we make the goal of life achieving satisfaction. It doesn't work that way. The only way to achieve satisfaction is when we live for something that's greater and bigger and other and outside of ourselves. Similar passage that speaks to this in the Psalms. Psalm 131. Listen to how the writer describes what's, what's, what's going on in his soul. The first two verses of that brief psalm. He says, My heart is not proud, O Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have a stilled, but I have stilled and quieted my soul. A picture of a soul that's satisfied, of a soul that's contented. I have stilled and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. Now, how do you wean a child? What's the process a child goes through to become weaned? I was trying to think of that. All of us that are parents have been through that process, and, 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 and we know how it works. And I was trying to think, how can I sum that up? And I came up with what I think are two words that are at the core of weaning a child. And those words are strategic disappointment. Think about it. You wean a child by deliberately withholding from that child what he or she thinks she wants. You, you wean a child by depriving him or her of, of what he or she feels she needs. And in time, that child learns that what he or she thinks she wants. Well, the child learns that they can be master and not the slave of those appetites that are driving them. In, in time, the child comes to learn that these things aren't as essential, these things aren't as necessary as they previously thought. And what the psalmist is saying here in the 131st Psalm, what he's saying is his soul is becoming like that. His soul is making that journey. And as a result, it's not constantly troubling him with all the unsatisfied desires. It's not continually burdening him with this series of ongoing expectations that can never be quenched. He's learning that his soul can be satisfied with God. Even if all these other appetites and desires are at work within his life, he's realizing that God is enough. All these desires that are floating around in his life, he doesn't have to cater to them. He doesn't have to gratify them every single moment because he realizes the pursuit of gratification, the constant chase after delight and enjoyment and pleasure and material plenty, he's realizing that that will dismantle the soul. It won't satisfy it. It'll cause the soul to become blemished and disfigured and marred. And that leads to the second observation. Is that your soul and my soul, the soul is more satisfied when it is less self-preoccupied. When we die to ourselves, that's when our soul begins to come to life. When we no longer make the quest for personal satisfaction the major pursuit in our life, that's when our soul begins to flourish. That's when our soul begins to become more healthy. One of the great passages, incredible passages that speaks to this, it comes to us from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 55 
Familiar words, I'm sure, to many of you. Wonderful invitation that God sounds through the words of the prophet Isaiah. Beginning at verse 1, he says, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. For why spend your money on what's not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and see what is good and your soul will delight in the richest affair. Give ear, come to me, hear me, that your soul might live. What the prophet's saying is that those of us that are thirsty... Those of us that are driven by unsatisfied desires, which when you think about it, that really is all of us. For our souls, by their very nature, they're needy, they're, Im- they're impoverished, they, they, they need something, they, they, they cannot make it apart from God's presence. What the prophet's saying is, you know, those of us that are driven by desires, we're not going to find those desires satisfied by giving in to them, by yielding to them. What's going to satisfy those desires is something we can't buy with money. What's going to satisfy those desires is something we can't accumulate through our effort. The only thing that can satisfy our soul is something we can't purchase. Something we can't strive to acquire. And when we realize that, when we cease our striving for things and we recognize that what our soul really needs is something we can't merit, something we can't earn. He goes, when we recognize that, he goes, then you can partake of the richest affair. And then your soul will be satisfied. What our soul needs most desperately is something we can't obtain, something we can't procure on our own. The soul is more satisfied when it is less self-preoccupied. And that leads to this third and final observation that the ultimate issue in the universe is not our personal gratification, it is God's gratification. The ultimate issue is not our, my personal satisfaction, it is His satisfaction. Again, Jesus speaks to this so powerfully. One of the familiar stories he told, Luke chapter 12, is is where we find it. He picks it up at verse 16. Again, many of you will find this to be a very familiar story. Jesus tells the crowd around him and his disciples a parable. He says, The ground of a certain man produced a good crop, and he thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I'll store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life, or in the original language, your soul, your life, your soul will be demanded from you, and then, you, then who rather will get what you have prepared for yourself? And Jesus concludes this story by saying, this is how it is, and how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich towards God. The guy in this story believed that he had... Uh, found the secret of satisfaction. And it was with all the stuff in his life, and he had a lot of stuff. He'd done well. He'd uh, acquired a windfall, if you will. And so he essentially says to himself, you know what I think I'm going to do? I'm going to enjoy the spoils of all this stuff. I'm going to take advantage of the good fortune that, that, that I've acquired, and I'm going to give myself over to enjoy and and and. and, and Experience the wonder of all these things that I've put together. But as Jesus goes on, obviously things didn't turn out 
the way he anticipated they would. In fact, they turned out much differently. And I think a key to understanding this story centers around the phrase that, that, that Jesus uses in the 20th verse when he says that this night your life will be demanded of you, of your soul will be demanded of you. That, that word there will be demanded of you. That word's actually a, a technical term from the financial arena. Um, that was a word that was typically employed when, when a loan came due. And so there's a sense in which Jesus is saying, you know, your life, your soul, it's not yours. It doesn't belong to you. It's God's. It's been loaned to you. But as with any loan, it's got to be paid back and it will come due when you die. Folks, this soul of ours, your soul, my soul, this capacity placed within us, it was made by God, but it was also made for God. And that's why it's so often needy and barren and impoverished is because we try to fill it with things other than God. We try to take a shortcut or short-circuit it. And folks, these lesser things that we give ourselves to, thinking that they'll satisfy our soul, they don't. These things that we pour ourselves into, thinking that it'll do something about this ache that dwells deep within us, it won't. Folks, our souls were made by God. And they're made for God. And anything other than God in our soul will leave them parched and destitute. In the 42nd Psalm, we we looked at a verse earlier, the fifth verse. I want us to look at the, the second verse now. It says, My soul thirsts for God. For the living God, where can I go and meet with God? That's a great question. My soul thirsts for God. At the core, it's a thirst for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with Him? Incredible question. And I'm convinced the answer to that question, the answer to that question is the central message of the New Testament. Because in the New Testament, we read about what happened to a man named Jesus on a cross, located on a hill named Calvary. I don't know if you've ever heard this terminology or or phraseology or not, but one of the terms that theologians use to describe the significance and the magnitude and the the, the meaning to reflect on that event, that what happened to Jesus on that hill called Calvary, on that cross. One of the terms that they use to refer to that, it's called the doctrine of satisfaction. That term satisfaction, when it's used in a, a theological sense, it doesn't mean gratification the way we commonly use it. It has the more the sense of, of, of making restitution or, 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 or paying back what's been taken or, or mending what's been broken. And, and the idea behind the doctrine of satisfaction is this. Basically, that our souls, because they're sinful, they can't satisfy God's demand for holiness and justice and righteousness. We can't meet the expectations He has of us. Just can't. The satisfaction that He's due, it's greater. It's greater than what we can do individually. It's greater than what we can do collectively. We can't meet the requirement. We can't render up to God what's necessary to restore the sense of honor that was breached by our rebellion and by our disobedience. And so what the doctrine of satisfaction said is that God took it upon Himself. And sent his son to do that for us. He sent Jesus to pay the price. 
And when Jesus suffered on our behalf and died that atoning death, he satisfied the demands of God's honor by his infinite merit and by his act of ultimate obedience. On the cross, Jesus suffered and died. He suffered not just in body, he also suffered in his soul. He suffered in the very depths of his being because he was satisfying the demands of God's justice and holiness and righteousness. He was dying the death that we all deserve to die. He was paying the price that we all should have paid, but we could never pay. Not just individually, but collectively. And the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is that without Him doing what He did on that cross... Without him doing that, not only would our soul not be able to get along well, our soul wouldn't be able to get along at all. His sacrificial death on the cross. Without that, our soul would be hopelessly marred, hopelessly blemished, and we would just be adrift looking for something that there is no answer to. But you see, because Jesus did what he did, you and I can know satisfaction of soul. The soul can know the satisfaction it so desperately craves and longs for because his atoning death, it's the bridge that each of us need to walk across. And it's through walking across that bridge that we can have a personal and a meaningful and intimate connection with the God. The God who not only made our soul, but the God who made it simply so we could be connected with Him. And it's through that connection with Him that our soul is satisfied. And so this morning as we think about the cross... And as we think about the death of Jesus, I, I want us as a church family to, to come together around an observance that followers of Jesus have used for almost 2,000 years now as a device of memory. Communion. I want each and every one of you this morning to have the chance the chance to reflect upon the incredible price and provision that was put in place through Jesus' death on the cross for you. And so your soul could know satisfaction. This Sunday is also Worldwide Communion Sunday. I don't know if you're aware of that or not, but it's a day when, when we link arms with brothers and sisters from around the world. People that speak different languages than we speak. People that live under a different political system or a cultural system than we do. People that have different denominational affiliations or labels attached to them. But we share a common heritage and a common longing as they also, like we, look to Jesus and His death as the hope of their salvation and as the locus of their soul satisfaction. And on that basis, we affirm that in spite of the many differences that we might have, in spite of the fact we don't seek the same language, in spite of the fact that we don't live under the same political system, in spite of the fact that we don't have the same set of cultural expectations, in spite of the fact that we don't have the same label attached to us, we're saying that doesn't matter. Those things are secondary. But because of what Jesus has done, that's primary. And on that basis, we are brothers and sisters in Him. We're members of the same family of faith. And we are going to spend eternity with them. Because what Jesus did for us, he did for all. And he's got an incredible family that is diverse and unbelievably varied, but unified. Because we all come to him the exact same way. I'm going to give you the chance to participate in a moment. 
Before we do, just want to share a few words of instruction, particularly for those of you that are new and have not been a part of a communion observance, how we practice it here at Lakeside. Please know, first of all, please know that you do not have to be in any way affiliated with this church to participate. And if you participate, it's not like you're joining (laughs) this church. We, We do not believe this table is our table. We believe it's his table. And he's the one that extends the invitation, not us. And his invitation is to whoever. It's to all of us. And so we simply ask this morning, we say this is open to you. And all we ask is that you, you, you either have an, you have an understanding of the incredible spiritual significance that's captured in the bread and the cup. That, that you either be a, a, a professed follower of Jesus or, or you be someone who by your participation is saying, Jesus, I'm opening myself up to you. I, I, I'm exhausted from trying to create the satisfaction by myself and, and I desperately long for it and I want you to meet me at that place deep within me. I've just been sucked dry. I am worn out from trying to fill that void that exists deep within my being. And so I want you to step in that place. And I want to go forward, not just giving lip service to you. I want to go forward in intimate relationship to you. I want you to make yourself known to me in a new and a fresh way. If that's where you are this morning, and if that is what you're feeling, then I want you to make this observance, these next few moments, I want you to make that a very personal and intimate thing between you and God. Yeah, you're in a room full of people. But when it comes to that bread and that cup, it's just you and Him. And I want you to take advantage of that opportunity to transact business with Him. Second thing, and servers, go ahead and come if you would right now. Let's begin to get ready. What we're going to do is we're going to ask you in just a moment to to stand, and you'll exit by the aisle to your right and come up front, and there'll be three couples here at the front of your section that will be with the bread and the cup, and you can perceive to partake the bread, the cup, and then make your way across and return to your seat via the aisle to your left. And if you can just hold the elements together until everybody's been served, we can participate together. That'd be great. Third thing, if for some reason this morning you're not comfortable or you choose not to participate, that's that's okay. This is an optional observance. And if for whatever reason you feel a bit awkward or ill at ease, feel free to to sit this out. No one's going to judge you. No one's going to look down on you. No one's going to do anything like that. We want this to be meaningful. And if right now you're just apprehensive and it can't be meaningful, we understand. We don't want to put pressure on you in any way. And then finally, if you'd like to participate, but you're not able to, to walk up front. If you would just kind of, when after the servers are through, just kind of slip your hand up. We'll come back to you where you are and serve you at your seat so that you can participate and be a part of this observance. Okay? Everybody understand? Let's pray. And then invite the Lord to come to us in new and fresh ways through this observance. Father, we do thank you We do thank you for what you have done for us through the provision of your son Jesus. And now in these moments, as we tangibly remember and reflect, we pray that you'd come to us in a new and a fresh way and ignite or reignite within us a depth of love and thankfulness for who you are and for what you've done. As we come to your table, may you come to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Komm näher. Simple symbols. Nothing magical about them. But that to which they point is so profound that we need to take time as followers of Jesus to periodically reflect, remember. The bread you hold in a hand is symbolic of his body a body that was sacrificed, a body that was yielded up, a body that was nailed to a cross 
to pay the ultimate price so that you and I could know satisfaction at the very depth of our soul. He never asked us. He never consulted us. He never said, you guys think it'd be a good idea? He just did it. And we are the beneficiaries. So as we partake of the bread now, let us do so with thanks and gratitude. Partake. And the cup is symbolic of his blood. Blood that was shed, blood that was spilt, blood that was poured out. So that we could not just be forgiven for our past, but so that we could be cleansed and empowered to live a victorious future that doesn't have to revisit the past. I mean, Jesus, when he did what he did, he took care of everything. He did it comprehensively. Nothing more needed. He took care of it. And so as we take this cup, let us do so with a renewed commitment to allow what he did to be operative in us so that we can live as people who reflect and represent him to the world around us. Let's partake with thanks and commitment. Let's pray. Father, in these moments, we, we recognize again what you've done for us. And Father, I know, I, I, feel, I feel the need this morning to confess and ask your forgiveness for the many, many times in which I've tried to look to something lesser to provide the satisfaction that you alone are able to provide. Father, we're so grateful of the fact that you paid the price so that we can know this satisfaction deep within our lives. And I pray, Father, that in this moment, this renewing moment, that you would empower within us a capacity and a capability to live as you would have us to live, drawing from you and looking to you as our source of satisfaction. Thank you, Father, for the fact that we are part of a worldwide family and we celebrate that unity because of what you've done for each of us, because you've done it for all of us. We ask your blessing and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I would like us to all stand up. And Melinda, if you just continue as we, that song we were singing, let's close out our worship by reflecting on the blood of the Lamb that was provided and paid for us.
Father, we thank you for this day and for this incredible opportunity to remember again the provision that you have made for us through the body and the blood of your Son, Jesus. Father, empower us to live in ways that testify to the reality of his presence in us so that this week as we go through our world and interact with people, they will not see us so much as they'll see you in us. May that be. We'll give you the praise for that. So we ask it in his magnificent name. People agreed and said, Amen. Amen. Thanks so much, friends, for being here today. God's richest blessing on you as you go.